The 20th century's most prolific serial killer is largely unknown throughout the world, though he brutally murdered at least 140 children. Posing as a priest and a teacher, he lured poor young boys away from their families, raped them, and murdered them. Committing his crimes in various regions of Colombia, South America in the 1990s, he eluded Colombia's authorities for nine long years. What goes on inside the mind of a serial killer? And how do the authorities go about catching one? We'll find out from the experts as we track Garavito, the world's worst serial killer. In the US and Europe, where information on serial killers is plentiful, authorities still have difficulty capturing these criminals. But imagine if a serial killer struck in a place where there was no authority over the populace, a place where the deaths of poor young boys could go unnoticed by society at large. Colombia, South America, population 41 million. The scene of political and social strife for the past 50 years, Colombia struggles daily to stabilize itself and provide security to its citizens. Mark Chernick, a professor of government and Latin American studies, has been following the history of violence in Colombia for many years. Colombia is a country with, with a long history of violence. And in the early 80s, when I was doing dissertation research at Columbia University in New York, I went to Colombia, the country, uh, to study attempted negotiations between the government and the armed guerrilla movements to find a way out of it. Twenty years later, uh, the violence is higher, uh, and I've been studying the peace process and the violence now for the last 20 years. At first, the random disappearances of street children didn't raise many eyebrows. While the authorities were aware of the problem, the people of Colombia were somewhat indifferent. You don't see many homeless adults in Colombia. You see homeless children. There's a large population of street children. They're caught up in a special subculture, and it's increasingly a violent one. And they disappear, and no one notices. The day began as usual at Los Santaros Park in the city of Villa Vicencio in eastern Colombia. Ivan Savagal, along with other poor children of the region, hoped to sell some lottery tickets in order to pay for their schooling. But on this particular day, Ivan didn't come home at the usual time. Panicked, Ivan's mother alerted the authorities. It was the only hope she had of finding her son. She would have to convince someone to take the case on. That someone turned out to be prosecutor Fernando Aya. When we got there, Dr. Fernando was the first one to approach my husband and say, don't worry, we'll help you with your case. Aya had been investigating the murders of 13 children on the outskirts of Via Vicencio for six months. Several mass graves had been found, something that was not at all common in his usual homicide investigations. The strange disappearances and the discoveries of children's bodies weren't limited to Via Vicencio. Hundreds of miles away in the heart of Colombia's coffee district, many mothers were also desperately searching for their sons. Authorities worked diligently to solve the crimes, but homicide reports involving children continued to grow throughout Colombia with no end in sight. Death notices extended to 70 locations throughout 13 states or departments and even to towns in the north of Ecuador. In November of 1998, in a place known as Nacederos, a city 380 kilometers to the west of Bogota, there was another gruesome find. The bodies of 14 children were found, all bearing numerous cuts made by blades or knives. The initial forensic analyses of the victims determined that the children were Caucasian between the ages of 8 and 14. Dr. Christy Kokonis, a forensic psychologist, talks about why the killer fixated on young boys. His victim choice of young boys clearly points to the fact that he had a fantasy of uh, 
becoming involved with young boys. Boys, this was his preferred uh, victim type, um, and that he needed to become intimately involved with these boys. That he needed to bind them in a certain way is suggestive of his sadistic fantasies. This is someone who um, needs to feel godlike. Robert K. Ressler, director of Forensic Behavioral Services International is one of the pioneers of criminal profiling. His work has helped capture some of the most notorious serial killers in history. The serial killer, from a, a psychodynamic view, is basically an antisocial personality, be better known as a psychopath. Uh, most crimes of the serial killer are sexually oriented. I would say 90 plus percent of serial killers are sexually motivated. Uh, you have a person who is a, generally speaking, a white male. They're in their mid to late 20s on up to their early to mid 30s. So you have a kind of a 10 year window there of uh, acting out. You're dealing with an individual who uh, commits his crimes in different times, different locations, different places. And there is a cooling off period in between each of those uh, events. Now the authorities face the challenge of identifying the bodies with no time to waste. The identities of these victims could lead to more clues as to the killer's whereabouts. It was impossible to trace the fingerprints of the victims because only bony remains had been found. There were no dental records for the bodies either. The fact that these children had received no dental treatments indicated that they may have been very poor and therefore related to the disappearances of street children. Only two methods of identifying the bodies remained, running genetic tests based on DNA extracted from the bones, and creating forensic reconstructions. Frank Bender, a forensic artist, explains the process. They always send me the actual skull. I photograph it from all angles with a long lens so I don't distort the image in any way. And then I study it and I study the asymmetry. I may draw lines on it to show how one side is a little lower than the other to remind myself so when I'm covering it with the clay, I don't lose any of that. I walk around with the photographs. I study them while I'm out having coffee. I live with this person. I really search for the individual qualities. And the more time you put into building it up and thinking about it, living with it, the more of the individual quality comes out. Colombia's most renowned forensic reconstructionist, Mario Leon Artunduaga, began work on the second alternative. Right away, Artunduaga's team faced a major obstacle. While there were international parameters available for the forensic reconstruction of adults, there were no such parameters for children. The bones of children are still going through the growth process. The cranium is larger and more delicate. Their physiognomy is smaller and their eyes are larger. Proportionally, the measurements are very different. It was a fact that threw Artunduaga off course. In order to help the authorities and the families of the victims, he would have to create his own parameters. To accomplish this, he brought a child to his lab with features that were similar to those of the victims. He measured the child's face from top to bottom and settled on some specific patterns. Artunduaga knew that he could not follow established methods and guidelines due to the children's incomplete growth process. The cranium of a child is proportionally bigger than the rest of his body. In adults, the face is easily measurable and the symmetry is amazing once you divide it into three parts. The measurements go from the hairline to the arc of the eyebrows, from the eyebrows to the tip of the nose, and from there to where the chin ends. According to Frank Bender, there are other factors that determine the reconstruction of a face. Well, basically, the science is just knowing roughly the facial tissue muscle thicknesses. But more important than that is what are the forms of the skull dictating? You know, that's the framework of the face. Is one eye lower than the other? Is one side of the nasal aperture, which is the hole in the skull where the nose goes, is that a little lower? There's an asymmetry to every head, every face. And it's a matter of making sure that you bring that out. 
As Artunduaga worked on his reconstructions, investigators all over Colombia were working through their leads and hypotheses as fast as possible. Traces of wax had been found at the crime scenes. This made investigators suspect that the crimes had been committed by members of a satanic cult. Other hypotheses revolved around drug dealer paybacks, revenge, and organ trafficking. In Via Vicencio, Prosecutor Aya was still searching for Ivan Savagal. The boy's characteristics were similar to those of the other murdered children. These similarities were the beginning of the killer's profile. Criminal profiling is taking the dynamics of a crime and, and basically looking at a crime scene uh, live or a photograph or videotaped. Uh, it, you have to have access to that crime scene. You have to see the positioning of the body. You have to see the body as it was at the scene and then as it is cleaned up in an autopsy situation. You have to have access to investigative reports, to witness statements, and you have to have all of that information which creates a foundation. You have to have a foundation to build a profile on. Aya decided to investigate the areas in which the murders had taken place. Upon visiting the sites, he observed that they were generally well populated. If there were so many people around, why hadn't anyone noticed the smell of decomposing bodies? or heard anyone scream as they were attacked. Aya chose a strategic 24-hour point of surveillance from which he could track all the movements of people nearby. This tower offered the ideal conditions. From their position on the tower, Aya and his team were able to observe the caretakers of the grounds who patrolled the area on horseback. This bird's eye view of the crime scene revealed why the caretakers had not been aware the crimes were taking place. When we became familiar with the areas surrounding the crime scenes, we realized that it was impossible for the caretakers to be aware of those killings because the terrain was very dense, the vegetation quite thick, and you couldn't really walk through it. It was clear the jungles of Colombia would be a major obstacle. In another part of the country, Aldemar Duran, a seasoned detective who would end up playing a pivotal role in the capture of the fugitive, had been investigating the deaths of three children for over a year. In their investigation, they found some striking similarities to crime scenes in other parts of the country. When these three cases were discovered by our team, we began pooling files from 1991 to 1998 that had been archived. And that's where we came across a series of relevant events involving youngsters who had been victimized under some very special characteristics. They found the position of the bodies, certain fibers from rope that was used to tie up the victims, and even empty liquor bottles to be very similar to evidence found at the other crime scenes. Dr. Kokonis explains why patterns start to emerge from the crime scenes of serial killers. The problem is fantasy is always perfect. You can fantasize it and you will have it go down exactly the way you want. But in reality, it never works that way. So what happens is they commit the crime. The fantasy didn't, the crime didn't quite meet the fantasy. The fantasy was better. So they will then uh, have to commit the crime again. They'll think about it, elaborate on it a little bit more, think about what went wrong, um, and then try it again. Their fantasy becomes reality. They step over that line, and they now victimize a human being. And in so doing, they, they hold the life of that human being in their hand. And it is their life to take at will, and oftentimes they do. And that's what, once they re step over that threshold, there is no return, and the crimes become repetitive. In the labs, after analyzing the wounds on the bodies found in the different areas, forensic doctors suggested the possibility that they were dealing with just one man, a sexual deviant, an idea that would take the investigation in a new direction. If there was only one killer, Aldemar Duran wanted to capture him. According to Robert Ressler, the best way to catch a killer is to think like one. In researching, in interviewing criminals who have committed these awful crimes, you, you develop a sense of intuition where, in fact, you begin to think a lot like the criminal thinks. And that is, is an ability that some people can deal with and some people cannot. And, of course, the idea is to have enough 
basis of experience to see the similarities and the common thread patterns that flow between these various types of fenders. Duran dedicated his time and effort to studying everything that was known about serial killers. We were going to solicit information from the FBI so that they could send us some documents, texts, so that we could get up to speed. Here in Colombia, which psychiatrist or psychologist could you possibly turn to if no one had even managed a case such as this one? On February 6, 1999, more bodies were found, this time in Palmira, 60 kilometers south of Nacederos where they had found the 14 bodies a year before. Carlos Herrera, an investigator familiar with the files of 45 children killed since 1995 in Colombia's immense sugar plantations, took on the new case, unwittingly joining investigators around the country on their search for one man. 13 pieces of evidence had been recovered from the crime scene in Palmira and Herrera began analyzing them immediately. The killer leaves behind his underwear, leaves his shoes, his eyeglasses, his money. He leaves many objects which could lead us to him, and he leaves the scene and abandons these objects. If he leaves the scene in this state, that means he is running from something. Meanwhile, Detective Duran decided that if they were going to find this killer who was operating in the world of the homeless, they'd have to infiltrate that world themselves. The investigators placed some of their best men undercover. The mission was dangerous. One mistake could cost a detective his life. Outfitted with microphones and dressed as indigents, the undercover detectives traveled each and every corner of the sordid and dangerous world of the Colombian homeless. As Duran's men ingratiated themselves into this Colombian underworld, Carlos Herrera had discovered several details which would bring the prosecutors one step closer to the criminal's physical appearance. Herrera analyzed a pair of men's shoes that were found at the crime scene in Palmira. He detected an unusual fraying of the heel on the right shoe. The piece displayed pressure on two points and there was no evidence of wear on the front part of the shoes a sure sign that the subject's foot had to be smaller than the size shown on the shoes. He was even able to detect how the suspect might walk. He suggested that the suspect had a limp and might rotate his foot when he walks, which would explain the uneven wear on the shoes. This could mean that the suspect had sustained some kind of injury. This limp that Herrera theorized about could also have another cause one link to the killer's murderous impulses. Dr. Jonathan Pincus, neurologist and author of the book Base Instincts, explains how a certain part of the brain controls both motor skills and personality. The part that's just over the eyes and in the midline, which is called the supraorbital part of the frontal lobe, has a great deal to do with personality. What sort of a person you are? Are you an irritable, difficult person? Are you a happy-go-lucky, easy-going person? Uh, uh, are you very quiet, but given to great displays of temper? Uh, there are different kinds of people, and those are determined by the brain. The frontal lobe does a lot of things, and the most posterior part of the frontal lobe is devoted to voluntary movement. Uh, if it were damaged or removed, uh, there would be weakness on the opposite side of the body. More studies revealed that this person's height range was between 1.63 meters and 1.67 meters. The criminal also left behind a pair of glasses that had been partially burned. While they couldn't account for the charring on the glasses, tests revealed that the user of these glasses suffered a condition which afflicts people in a specific age range. We determined from the prescription on the lenses that the user was between 40 and 45 and between 55 and 60 years old. A detailed study of the everyday wear of the glasses also produced a presumed facial structure. The wearer had bent the arms of the glasses, indicating that he might have oddly placed ears. Investigators had also discovered that the criminal moved from one place to another with ease. This was determined after tracing some currency left by the killer at the crime scenes. There were nearly 180,000 pesos that were traced to the killer, which had been distributed in the southern part of the country and in the city of Ipiales 
on the border of Ecuador. The crime labs had produced clear results. They were looking for a man with a limp who was between 1.63 and 1.67 meters tall, between the ages of 40 and 45, or 55 and 60, who always consumed the same brand of liquor and who wore eyeglasses. The authorities pulled legal paperwork from the last 10 years involving pedophiles. After finding over 5,000 cases of aggression against minors, they discarded all those relating to attacks against girls. There were over 1,500 files left. After inspecting them, the investigators excluded those involving perpetrators under age 42. This left 95 persons, of which only 45 were within the 1.63 and 1.67 meters height range. They then proceeded to select those people who committed crimes in the areas where the majority of the victims were found. This sorting process revealed 25 names. While Duran's men continued to work undercover, Duran himself worked in silence. His colleagues had begun calling him the killer's shadow because of his dedication to the case. A dedication that took him to Bogota for more background on these types of killings. After days of reviewing the documents, the shadow came across a case reported in 1996 in the city of Tunja, located 250 kilometers to the north of Bogota. The file described the disappearance and death of a 12-year-old boy named Ronald Delgado. His body had been found in some bushes, and the characteristics of his death were similar to those currently being investigated. According to the documents filed that year, the owner of a store and several local prostitutes testified that they had last seen the youngster in the company of a man who was not from the region. The file described how the suspect had been detained and interrogated, only to be let go due to insufficient evidence. That suspect was Luis Alfredo Garavito, a man whose name was also on the list of the 25 suspects. The photocopy of Garavito's ID contained in the file showed that he was a native of Genova, the town where the first three cases the shadow was investigating had been reported. Another bit of information that piqued the investigator's interest was the place of residence given by Garavito in his written statement. He declared that he lived in Trujillo, a place where children's bodies had also been found. Meanwhile, searches were being conducted in Pereira, a city hundreds of kilometers to the west of Bogota. The results of these searches pointed to one suspect, Pedro Pablo Ramirez Garcia, known as Pedro Pachuga. This individual had a long record of sexual abuse against children that began in 1980. Ramirez limped from the same leg as the man they were looking for. He was 44 years old. His height was within the range specified by the detectives and he had been seen in the street selling honey contained in the same kind of liquor bottles found at the crime scenes. The disappearance of two other boys on October 1st, 1997, from a bus terminal in Pereira, seriously implicated Pedro. The two young boys were found dead, their bodies showing signs of having been tortured and sexually abused. Furthermore, another boy had identified Pedro as the man who tried to rape him. The eyewitness testimony was all the authorities needed to begin their search for Pedro Pachuga. They found him on the street, captured him, and for the first time in years, the investigators breathed a sigh of relief. They finally had someone behind bars. But their captive kept proclaiming his innocence. With a body count on the rise and the police left with very little to go on, Colombian authorities had gotten word from the forensic labs that there was a possibility that all of the crimes they were investigating might be the work of one man. But their suspect was denying any involvement. While he was in jail, four children were murdered in Bogota under similar circumstances as the other crimes. The prosecutor's office had made a fatal mistake. 
Bewildered, the authorities took the process of collecting evidence at the crime scenes to another level. They decided to follow a special procedure that had been developed in Great Britain. This search method proposes a hand-by-hand -hand search of an area defined by colored ropes. When something is found, the place is marked with a flag, and then the evidence is recorded with a photograph. However, this system had been designed for very different conditions than those the Colombian investigators would encounter. The police force was up against Mother Nature. The vegetation in and around these crime scenes was so thick that the British search procedure, which was intended for the well-manicured lawns of England, was nearly impossible to carry out in the jungles of Colombia. Still, the Colombian authorities pressed on. The places where the bodies and items were found were divided in 80 centimeter wide strips for millimeter by millimeter dredging. The search parties began using rakes to get through the plant life, but soon realized that they needed something better. Investigators had no choice but to use the same instruments used by the local peasants in order to advance the search. They modified tools such as this one, known as the garancho by Colombian farmhands, a type of wooden hook with an outward arm, which is ideal for digging in wooded lands. This instrument became the detective's best ally. While the work continued in the field, the morphologists were making progress with the facial reconstructions. Their work brought together techniques known and used in other countries. They used Russia's research in reading bones, which allows scientists to find many details. They used America's systems for filing and statistics. They also used the British biological research for their reconstructions. By mixing these aspects, they got closer and closer to the actual bone and facial structures of the victims. With this technique, Artundwaga reconstructed the faces of four boys. They were recognized by family members. Now the investigation would run its course with the aid of a new tool. Meanwhile, Duran had tracked down Garavito's family in Trujillo thanks to an address the suspect had left on a dossier. Duran met with Esther Garavito Cubios, one of Luis Alfredo's sisters. Duran wanted to know if Garavito had left any papers there. The woman confirmed that indeed, her brother had asked her to keep a bag full of personal items for him. They found elements that would reveal astounding details about the suspect's life. There were documents, photographs, and mementos of his travels. They also found an entire box of notebooks and pads. They often keep journals about what they do so that they can relive the crimes in between the killings. Um, they use this for masturbatory purposes. It becomes their pornography. Um, it becomes their way to relive the crime and to delight in it again. So they will keep journals about it. They may also take notes about uh, what didn't work and uh, what did work. Uh, they'll very carefully catalog what type of uh, victim it was, the age, uh, description of the child, what the exact events that took place, uh, how they felt, uh, what the child may have said to them or the victim may have said to them. Again, as much information as they can so that they can relive the crime. Aldemar Duran's team carefully analyzed each item. The bag also contained photos of Luis Alfredo Garavito himself. Days later, Duran established that a judicial body in Corinto implicated Garavito in another homicide, also involving a minor. He returned to the documents in the bag from Trujillo and found a receipt for money wired to a woman in Pereira. The prosecutor's office tracked down the address and to everyone's surprise, recovered another suitcase filled with chronicles of his travels from 1994 to 1997. They found national and regional newspapers, bus tickets, photographs, and even a few lottery tickets, like the ones Ivan Salvagal was selling before he disappeared. Also, synthetic fibers, razors, and lubricants, the same elements that were found in all the crime scenes, were found in the bag. We surmised that the person who had been in Palmyra committing the crimes must have burned himself judging from evidence we had found at the scene and the condition of the crime scene itself. Duran's theory was correct. 
and explained the charring on the glasses and other items found at the crime scenes. The wounded and heavily burned criminal traveled six hours in considerable pain until he got to Pereira in an effort to distance himself from his latest victim. There he sought help in a small pharmacy, but then disappeared without a trace. Now detectives were certain that they were looking for a man with burns on his left arm, on his side, and on one of his legs. On the night of April 22, 1999, the search for Ivan Savagal was intensifying. At 7.15 p.m., police received an emergency call. Terrified, an auto store employee reported the presence of a boy who claimed to have escaped from a man who tried to sexually abuse him. The police and Ivan's mother, Maria, went to where the child had been found. Maria recognized the boy immediately. It was Ivan. Just imagine. I don't wish this on any mother because it's so devastating to get there and find your child saying someone wanted to rape him and kill him and telling him awful things. The authorities knew they were closing in on the child murderer. Yvonne told the police that a homeless man happened to pass by at the exact moment when the predator tried to assault him. That homeless man had saved Yvonne's life. The assailant followed Yvonne and the homeless man, but disappeared without a trace when the two were finally discovered by the store owner. The killer had narrowly escaped capture once again. Discouraged, the police headed back to headquarters to regroup. But then something unexpected happened. As Ivan was riding with his mother in a police car, he spotted the aggressor. The detainee identified himself as Bonifacio Moreira Liscano, a man whose name did not appear on the police list of 25 suspects. The authorities arrested him anyway. Not once did he show he was frightened. He wanted to avoid being captured by acting serene, and at no point did he seem agitated. They know what's supposed to be said, but they don't have the feelings behind it. So that you will get crocodile tears and things like that. Oh, I think it's just so tragic that, you know, this is happening to these children. I can't imagine what kind of person would do this sort of thing. Meanwhile, it's, it's them. They're the person that has done this. When Prosecutor Aya learned of Bonifacio's capture, he visited the prisoner and noted the amazing similarity between this man and Luis Alfredo Garavito. Later, Aya discovered Bonifacio Moreira's signature was different on each document that he signed on the night of his apprehension. Aya was now certain that they had the right man. After Bonifacio Moreira was detained, the prosecutor's office summoned investigators throughout the country to a summit meeting for the purpose of exchanging information on the case. Aya took with him the photograph of the man who tried to rape Ivan Salvagal. He contacted the detective, who had spent the most time on the heels of the criminal, Aldemar Duran. When Duran and the other investigators from the coffee district saw the photograph, they were speechless. The most dreaded serial killer of children that ever walked the earth was finally behind bars, Luis Alfredo Garavito. Everything matched. He was 42 years old. He was 1.67 meters tall. He wore glasses and he had scars and burns on his left arm and on his side. Luis Alfredo Garavito was born in Genova, a small town located in the center of Colombia, which, like few others, lived through the horrors of the Colombian Civil War during the 20th century. His home life wasn't without its battles either. Garavito's father was a very abusive man. Who was your most important teacher for patterns of behavior and thought? It's your parents. How do you get your sense of self-image and, and what, what your value is? It's from your parents. If you've got good parents, you've got a good feeling about yourself. If you've got terrible parents, you're likely to have a terrible feeling about yourself and also to say, uh, while you're cowering behind the couch, while your drunken father is at the door and, and uh, making everybody scared, someday I will be drunk and come home and everybody will be cowering when I enter the room. To escape this abuse, Garavito left home at a very young age and began wandering the world. He led an apparently normal life on the road, even holding his steady relationship with a woman who had a son from a previous relationship. By all reports, Garavito never harmed the woman's son. Not even this woman who was so close to him 
suspected this individual's criminal behavior. Behind a kindly facade hid a dreaded murderer. Even with all the evidence gathered against Garavito, the investigators had another obstacle to overcome. They still had to prove he was guilty in the eyes of the law. Because he knew the suspect well, Duran suspected that Luis Alfredo Garavito had kept other records of his travels and crimes. And perhaps the authorities would be able to find evidence more damning than that found in the other bags of clippings and notebooks. Duran and his colleagues talked Mrs. Ambar Toro, one of Garavito's best friends, into cooperating with the authorities. They wired Mrs. Toro with a hidden microphone and had her visit the jail where Garavito was being held. After a long conversation, Garavito confirmed the existence of yet another bag, which he had given to the wife of another prisoner. Once again, Duran had been right. More documents emerged, and even children's photos, as well as a wrinkled paper with strange marks scribbled on it. Authorities would later discover that this was a personal tally of his victims. But it was necessary to take samples of Garavito's hair and blood to a lab to run DNA tests on them and show the correlation between him and evidence collected at the crime scenes. It was also important to give Garavito an eye exam that would prove that the burnt glasses found in Palmira belonged to him. So that Garavito would not suspect anything and purposefully lie on his eye exam, all of the prisoners were subjected to the same test Garavito was. And while this was going on, Detectives searched his cell and obtained hair samples left on a pillow for the DNA tests. These tests came back positive, matching the DNA gathered in Garavito's cell to the DNA gathered from the liquor bottles and bodies at the crime scenes. But Colombian prosecutors weren't content with the information they had. For the first time, the Colombian authorities used the LINK program as an investigative tool. LINK is a Dutch software that is able to associate events, coincidences, and probabilities that might indicate connections between seemingly unrelated crimes. The LINK program was able to cross-reference five million pieces of data per second. The results were simple. Garavito had been in every one of the crime locations. Investigators fed hotel reports, testimonies, and evidence into the system. And what came out was confirmation that Garavito was their man. Colombian prosecutors were now satisfied that the case against Garavito was airtight. Armed with all the evidence, the prosecution decided to interrogate Luis Alfredo Garavito and get a confession. Garavito denied everything, saying none of the evidence belonged to him. He swore on his soul that he was a good man, and with tears in his eyes, he claimed that such accusations were nothing more than a grave error by the Colombian authorities. After eight or nine hours of interrogation, and not the slightest crack in Garavito's demeanor, the head of the interrogation, Lily Naranjo, decided to end it. It seemed the police had failed in their objective, which was to destabilize him, catch him in a lie, and coax a confession out of him. When you get a person who perseveres and really pursues a, a investigation, they are the only person that is going to be very effective with that individual. To bring in somebody cold who knows nothing about the case or just a little bit to do the final interrogations is a, is a losing game. So a person who's lived this, breathed this day in and day out for weeks, months, years is going to be the person that's going to break the individual down. And they can either be highly trained and highly skilled or they can be uh, basically just a, a natural type of interrogator, but that's the kind of person that'll, that'll break an individual in, 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 uh, in the final days. All hope was not yet lost. Nobody knew Garavito better than the killer's shadow, Aldemar Duran. Prosecutor Naranjo authorized a private meeting between Duran and the murderer. Using the prudence and keen perception of a weathered homicide detective, Duran described in precise detail the ways in which Garavito tricked his victims and the death rituals he performed on them. He hoped that making Garavito relive all of his fantasies would cause the killer's facade to break. Hearing of the killings left Garavito speechless. I knew of situations he had been in at each of these towns, how he had arrived, whom he had been with, how he was dressed. 
As Duran spoke, the killer began to feel his world crumbling around him. And finally, after 18 hours of questioning, Duran heard the words he'd been waiting for straight from Luis Alfredo Garavito's mouth. Garavito cried out for Duran to stop. The killer just couldn't take any more. This tape, made by Colombian authorities, registered the exact moment when the world's deadliest serial killer of children confessed his crimes. Then, with terrifying detachment, Garavito related the details of his crimes. He told the investigators about the children he had murdered, the objects he used when he assaulted them, and the places where these assaults took place. Garavito defended himself by saying that in every instance, he had been possessed by a malignant spirit. A psychological diagnosis determined that Garavito showed an antisocial personality disorder. He was probably raped from age 6 to 16 or something. And he has chosen victims who are friendless and, and homeless as he was. He has put himself in the in place of the abusive parent or whoever it was who uh, ab abused him. And, and I, as I said, uh, the psychiatrists call that identification with the aggressor, and I say it's like wanting to be like your old man. He gets uh, a, a great sense of pleasure out of being the one who is now doing the torturing as opposed to the one who was being tortured. They enjoy uh, seeing the pain and suffering of another person. Um, but the pain is really just a tool to elicit that suffering that makes them feel godlike, that gives them an ego boost. Um, but it's a temporary fix. It's something that they need to repeat and to do again and again. The killer began to feel his world crumbling around him. And finally, after 18 hours of questioning, the killer just couldn't take any more. This tape, made by Colombian authorities, registered the exact moment when the world's deadliest serial killer of children confessed his crimes. In an effort to cooperate with authorities, Garavito provided information about the whereabouts of his victims. More bodies were unearthed. The final tally of bodies came to 140, though experts believe there could be more. Luis Alfredo Garavito remains in this prison under maximum security. He requested and has been granted protection against a possible assassination. In an effort to shorten his sentence, Garavito made a public apology for his crimes. I ask the Colombian people to forgive me, to give me the opportunity which maybe I deprived many people of. By showing regret and good behavior in jail, he will most likely walk the streets of Colombia again. This is most definitely, unequivocally, not someone that can be rehabilitated. That uh, when you see pedophilia and sadism particularly together, uh, and there is evidence that the person was a psychopath. There is no known treatment for psychopaths, and we know that these offenders continue to fantasize about this while incarcerated. They may create their own pornography while incarcerated. Um, when we've gone and talked to them, they will tell you the fantasies never stopped. People have neurological problems, some of those you can treat. You can treat migraine, you can treat epilepsy, you can, do, you can make their lives a little bit more uh, livable. Um, but the idea of rehabilitating someone to the point where they could function in society reliably without being violent, I think that that's unrealistic. Never before in Colombia's history had there been a legal case of this magnitude. This caught the Colombian courts unprepared to punish Garavito. In Colombia, they can take the worst charge and double the penalty for it. But they can never exceed the maximum stipulated by the law. Therefore, in Colombia, the maximum for Garavito would be 40 years. 40 years of prison for 140 young lives lost. Worse than that, he could get out even sooner. By confessing, he gets time taken off his sentence. By working and studying and exhibiting good behavior, 
he gets more time taken off his sentence. Under the current system, uh, it is very likely that Garavita would be released. Not only likely, it's inevitable. There, there is no such thing as life without parole. There is no death penalty. Under their existing law, Garavito could serve as little as 12 years. For now, new bodies continue to surface, and investigators continue to work diligently, identifying them. But Duran's biggest worry is copycats, or other people who might want to imitate the sociopath. Despite all his years of experience, and the knowledge of having put the biggest serial killer of children behind bars, Duran says he can never forget the flood of emotions that broke his heart the day he found the first body of a little boy. Nor can he ever forget the anguish on the faces of parents who are still desperately seeking their little ones.